Technical Progress and Evolution. What is this about? In my last video, I talked about the progress against colonization and colonialism and how this has been shaped by the development of technology and production worldwide. And I finished with the question as to why the productive forces advance rather than just moving randomly. In this talk, I'm going to be sharing some exciting new theoretical advances that enable us to think this through. It's called assembly theory and it's developed by the chemist Lee Cronin and his team at Glasgow University. And he focuses on assembly in chemistry and living organisms. I'm going to, towards the end of this, having explained his theory, expl apply it to the production using tools. The theory was set out in a paper in Nature last month. Uh, if I remember, I'll stick that at the bottom of the, the video. Some background theory that it's worth looking at, if you're interested in this topic, is the book Origins of Order by Stuart Kaufman, which Cronin himself relies on to some extent. And I myself draw on the origins of order in my book How the World Works. Now look at these things. Are these tools, are they means of production? They look just like stones, but perhaps they were, because chimps use things very like these to crack nuts. If we look at these, old Dovan style tools, it looks much more plausible that they're means of production, that they've been made by someone. And when we look at these, then these are certainly tools. They were crafted, these Clovis points. How can we tell which were made and which arose naturally? The pebbles that may have been used as hammers by chimpanzees were smooth whereas the Clovis points had multiple facets and had clear fracture lines. But quartz gravel like this also has multiple facets and clear fracture lines. So the existence of fra uh, fracture lines and facets is not enough. What's the difference? Well, the cle key thing is that the Clovis points have a standard design. There are many copies found of the same basic design. Gravel, on the other hand, is randomly fractured and no complex shape predominates. So natural fracturing doesn't produce standard designs, whereas human activity does. But look at this, these clamshells. Were these produced? Well, there are certainly lots of copies of them but they don't have any sharp fractures like the Clovis points. Nonetheless, we can immediately distinguish them from beach gravel. And you only have to glance down at gravel on a beach and you can spot the clamshells. These were produced in some sense of the word by living organisms. And there's something clearly in common between that and what humans do. What does assembly theory apply to? Well, in the paper that Cronin published, it applies to organic molecules, enzymes, DNA, cells, multicellular organisms, and I would say it also applies to machines and whole economies. What question does it answer? He's asking, how can we tell if something's been made? Is there a formula to tell us if something's been produced as a result of life, or more generally, if we're going to take into account 
prebiotic evolution as a result of some kind of Darwinian selection. And his team say, yes, there is. There is a way you can do that. What must go into this formula? Well, what do we have to consider when we're testing whether something was the product of selection? The first thing is the existence of multiple copies. I said the Clovis points are multiple copies. And the second is the inherent improbability of the object in question. Now, this is the famous face on Mars in the Cydonia complex. And it's inherently improbable that there should be a vast face carved on the surface of Mars. So it has a high improbability index. But is this evidence for or against the existence of alien constructors on Mars? If there were dozens of these faces, we would certainly be convinced that Martians had built them. But there's only one, so we assume it's due to chance. And it turns out later better images reveal it just to have been a trick of the light. But this is an important point. Something that appears improbable but only occurs once is unlikely to be the product of civilization or the product more generally of life. Let's consider something else. There are three trillion one hundred and seventeen million two hundred and seventy six two hundred and seventy five thousand five hundred and one base pairs in the human genome. Now how improbable is that? Well, the probability of the sequence arising by chance is one upon four to the power of three billion one hundred and seventeen million two hundred and seventy five thousand five hundred and one. And since there are four base pairs, that is one chance in two to the six billion two hundred and thirty four million five hundred and fifty one thousand and two. That's one in that. Two to the, I'm not going to read it out again. This is, is a number so vast that it's almost incomprehensible. If you put it into your computer and tell it to raise two to that power, I doubt you'll get an answer. By comparison, the number of atoms in the universe is reckoned to be about 2 to the 265. So we can say with great certainty that the existence of the human genome by chance is impossible. And we know not only is it inherently very improbable, but there must be something around 2 to the, 200, two to the 76 copies of the human genome going around in the world today in all the different people and all their different cells. Now let's see how we can, how Cronin proposes we treat this. He comes up with the assembly formula, which applies to a collection with a total of N subscript T molecules, for example, in a cell. And in this formula, Ni is the number of molecules of type I. And AI is the assembly index of the type of molecule. Now, what does that mean? The assembly index, he says, is the number of steps to construct the molecule from subcomponents. So the human genome, which is actually split over several uh, DNA molecules, is going to require three and a bit billion steps to build. It's going to require that number of steps to build the DNA in each new cell in our body from component-based pairs. So what he's got here is E to the 
AI, which is awaiting in terms of the improbability of the object or molecule ex existing. It's an exponential function of the number of steps. And he then scales it by ni minus 1, with number of copies minus 1. Why does he take away 1? Because he's saying, if there's only one copy of a thing, like the face on Mars, then n minus 1 is 0, so the assembly index is 0. And we assume the thing wasn't manufactured, wasn't assembled. Otherwise, the more copies you've got, the greater the weight it gets. So that's the basic formula. He's saying it applies to all things which are made out of a hierarchy of components. Atoms are the base level. These may then make simple organic molecules. These then make amino acids and nucleotides. These then make proteins and DNA chains, which compose cells. The cells then make multicellular organisms, and multicellular organisms make up ecosystems. The important point is that prior assembly creates the components that are used at the next level. In a living organism, there is a construction process out of basic molecules to build up larger and larger molecules, ending up with giant ones like DNA. And the, the assembly that's been achieved so far permits new levels of assembly that would otherwise be vanishingly improbable. The formation of DNA would be Im vanishingly improbable if there were not a whole lot of base pairs lying around, if there were not a copy of a previous DNA molecule, and there were not an enzyme, to a, a transcriptase enzyme, to make new copies. And his, this then, may, although the arising of a DNA molecule by chance is vanishingly small, once you're in a cell, where you have all the other components sloshing around, selected components sloshing around, then the probability of constructing it doesn't become vanishingly small. And this is the fundamental mechanism for the emergency of complex structures in life. And I would say it applies elsewhere. It can be applied to flint tools. You can apply his measure to flint tools. These, like many human products, arise from cutting, not assembly. But the same math applies. We still have the analogue of an assembly index. In this case, it's the number of flaking steps required to shape the tool. And the improbability of this occurring naturally is again going to be an exponential function of the number of steps. And we also find multiple tools characteristic of a given culture. I think this is a Mousterian culture ones I'm, I've shown there. Cronin makes the important point that an autocatalytic system, like a cell or an ecosystem, has a memory. And that memory is encoded in the set of compounds or objects that currently exist in the system, along with the constructional interdependencies that exist between these compounds. We're used to thinking of genetic memory in the form of the genetic code in DNA. But he's saying this is more general. It is the total set of currently existing products and their feedback relationships that constitute the memory of the system. And modes of production have memories as well. Encoded in the set of products that it currently produces and, and current or currently holds stocks of. 
For example, this steam pumping engine, an old Victorian steam pumping engine, contained iron castings, it contained wrought iron forgings, its pillars were made out of bricks, reinforced by wooden beams. In order to work, it had to have lubricants. In order to work, it had to have coal fuel. And it had to have brass bearings in order not to wear out. So there are subcomponents going into any given technology like this. And these subcomponents depend on what is being produced at the moment. So societies with technology have constrained futures. Technological innovations are constrained by what products currently exist. We know that Heron of Alexandria invented a steam turbine, but that turbine didn't result in the industrialization of the Roman Empire because the other components that are necessary to build powerful steam engines, like coal and an iron industry capable of producing large forgings, didn't exist. Innovation is the creation of new technical products. And the more technical products that already exist, the more innovations become possible by combining products that exist. Combination and selection are the basic mechanisms of evolution and combination and selection are the basic mechanisms of technical progress and the greater the stock of techniques the greater the stock of products the more likely a new innovation is and this is what gives directionality to the evolution of technology and this ultimately is what gives directionality to the forms of social organization that we experience.